And let's just jump into the first part. And that is putting the eye back into DNI. And when I say we, I'm involved both with a for-profit called Alaria with, that works on corporate DNI, a nonprofit called ARC that focuses on diversity and inclusion research and an academic research center. And everybody really wants to know this. How do diversity and inclusion or how does DNI influence company performance? You just heard Carol talk about the information that the NASDAQ shared in which they basically pointed out that there is a lot of data that suggests that greater diversity and inclusion are correlated with greater company performance. But what is disturbing about it is that in spite of the growing correlation, there is a lot of evidence that the results actually are not there. There was a great book that was published by Pamela Newkirk of New York University late last year, in which she collected data from multiple fields showing that in the last five decades, there literally has been no advancement. And there was also a very interesting article in HBR about two weeks ago, in which the authors who themselves have been working in diversity and inclusion for more than two decades, came to the conclusion that a lot of the data that people cite to support the business case is really not right. And it's really not as conclusive as some people like it to, to be. And they point out that even asking to provide a business case for diversity is really kind of the wrong thing to think about. After all, what is the business case for a homogeneous company? So we have a lot of problems. And when you're starting to hear internal strife and internal disagreements, it kind of makes you wonder, okay, what is going on and why is this happening? And I firmly believe that one of the reasons why we're starting to see these issues is this notion of what I call the DNI disconnect. The vast majority of people that talk about DNI, or sometimes you will hear the initials DEI, which stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm not gonna go into the differences and the definitions, but in general, there is this broad field of people that look at diversity and inclusion. And the problem is that the vast majority of the studies that we hear about and the initiatives focus exclusively on diversity. The NASDAQ resolution or that they just, the announcement they just made focuses on diversity. It's not focusing on inclusion. And more importantly, it's not just diversity in general, it's representation. And then you get into issues like the one that Wendy in the chat room pointed out. It's like this idea that diversity of thought is more important than demographic diversity. That's a really thorny issue that deserves its own 60 minute conversations. But let's just say that it has been used to argue against demographic diversity, which is just really not a good thing. So we all have to be very careful. And as Maury pointed out early on, and other people, it can be a bit of a minefield. The work that I'm going to show you is going to try to sidestep some of these issues and really get to the heart of matters. Now, why do we focus on diversity and on representation in particular? Well, we do that because quite frankly, diversity is easy to define and it's easy to measure. The, the EEO form that you see in the left panel over there is something that actually has been around for a long time. And it's how a lot of companies are mandated <clears throat> to measure representation in terms of ethnicity, in terms of gender and other characteristics. So this makes it relatively easy, at least superficially to measure representation. On the other hand, inclusion is hard even to define. There are many definitions of inclusion. And one of the ones that is very common is the one by the great Vernon Myers, who said diversity is being invited to the party, inclusion is being asked to dance. This is a great quote that really has a lot of intuitive meaning, but unless you're running a party company, how is that gonna help you figure out what to do in your company? What I'm going to suggest to you is that while I firmly believe that diversity in all of its forms is absolutely crucial to the success of our society, by itself, diversity is not enough. And let me explain why with a simple thought experiment. Suppose that I showed you four companies and asked you which of them performs better. One of these companies is completely homogeneous. The other company maybe just pays attention to just doing, you know, let's hire a token person of color or a woman or a person with a disability. A third company hires diverse candidates, but only in lower level ranks. And finally, the fourth company is fully diverse. And if I were to ask you just by looking at these pictures, which of these companies will perform better? The answer is, you don't know. Nobody knows. The reason why we don't know is because we don't have any tools that can help us to evaluate the impact of diversifying human capital. Now, many of you understand marketing. Many of you know what programmatic is all about. What is programmatic doing? It's helping you to optimize the diversification of your marketing assets to maximize sales. Just like in finance, portfolio management helps you to diversify your financial assets to maximize returns. When it comes to human capital, we don't know how to do that. Now, this is a huge problem 
because for most companies, human capital is both the most valuable asset because without people, you don't have a company, but it's also the most expensive budget item. And in fact, I like to play a little trick on people or, or do a little poll, poll, but we're not gonna do the poll right now, but just to give you a sense. I like to ask people, let's look at two numbers, total annual spend in advertising across every channel, every company in the United States versus total payroll spend, not labor costs, just payroll spend across every single company in the United States. Which one is bigger? Depending on the audience, some people guess correctly that payroll is larger than advertising, but even the most seasoned HR veterans typically do not realize that payroll is actually 30 times bigger. Now, these are 2019 numbers. I'll be curious to see where they come out in 2020, but they've been very consistent. Very consistently, we spend roughly 30 times as much on our human capital than we do on advertising. Then why the hell are we optimizing advertising, optimizing supply chain, optimizing logistics and inventory and where we invest our money, but we don't do that with our people? Why do we know the value of diversifying all those other assets, but not the single most valuable asset of our company? That's a big problem. What I've seen happen, and I heard, in fact, some of the comments that Maury was making earlier, is that there's this notion of the complexity, and Carol also made a comment about the complexity, right? So what people often do, because this is a really complex problem, is to take what I describe as a reductionist approach. We're going to try to divide and conquer. We're going to try to think about how diversity and inclusion impacts our innovation teams, how it impacts our uh, you know, creativity, how it impacts our sales, how it impacts our ability to retain and, retract, uh, and recruit talent. And the way that it often boils down is people making statements such as, you need to be a diverse company in order to be able to recruit talent from diverse backgrounds. You also need to have a diverse company in order to be able to retain the, work, the workers that you tried so hard to recruit. You also need to have greater diversity for greater productivity and innovation. We heard that comment about having the diversity of thought and driving true innovation. We also hear about people saying, well, of course, you need to have greater diversity both to reach broader markets and to make sure that people actually wanna come and work with you. So it's really about reputation in general. What virtually everyone who takes this kind of mindset fails to realize is the fact that these are intertwined and they cannot be separated and studied in isolation and then put back together. And let me give you an example that again, echoes some of the comments we heard from Carol about the unintended consequences. Suppose that I'm a company and somebody comes to me and says, we want to increase diversity. And just like so many companies are doing, the easiest place to think about it is to focus on recruitment. So what we're going to do is go out and team up with some HBCUs, some historically black colleges and universities, or maybe some MSIs, some minority serving institutions. And we're gonna hire some people at the entry level from those groups. So maybe we hire a bunch of black engineers into our company. So by doing that, lo and behold, our recruitment numbers go up, we have greater diversity. Now, day one, these people come into the company and they find that their managers doesn't assign them the same quality of tasks as they assign to other people. They don't understand some of the cultural issues. The leadership doesn't look anything like them. And back in the day pre-COVID, you go sit down in the cafeteria, people get up and move away from you. What's going to happen? Well, as it happens in many, many companies, these people leave. When they leave, your retention goes down, specifically as it relates to diversity. Your productivity over the whole company goes down because now you have to re-recruit rehire and retrain people that you've just lost. And of course, that's also gonna generate a bad reputation both externally where people say, oh, you don't wanna go work there. And internally where the leaders will look down and say, oh, see, we tried with those people and it didn't work out. And as a result of that, you're actually gonna have a negative impact on your recruitment because it will be hard to bring people in the company. So this is the message, just trying to force diversity can backfire. And it's a very, very dangerous thing to do. I like to give people the following analogy. My wife comes in and says, oh, honey, it's so cold in the house. Look, the thermostat's read 50 degrees. Oh, I'll fix that. I light a match and I put it under the thermostat. Wow, now the thermostat is reading 80. But meanwhile, the windows are broken, the roof is leaking and the door has got a crack, you know, big crack in it, okay? So you have to be extremely careful because just focusing on diversity and trying to force diversity is misguided at best and it can be very dangerous. So how do we fix that? Well, I'm going to show you now why we, meaning my colleagues and I, are convinced that inclusion is really the key. And then later I'll show you how you can actually define it and measure it in a very tangible way. 
another thought experiment. Suppose you have a perfect team, six people, 10 people, doesn't really matter, six people for convenience. And what I mean by perfect is that each of them is performing at their peak. And as a team, they all work perfectly together. It just simply does not get better than this. Now suppose that something happens in the company. Maybe one person is always being asked to do menial tasks they don't wanna do. Maybe they're not being listened to in meetings. Somehow this person is made to feel less than they would like to. And that interferes with their ability to work. What's going to happen is that their productivity is gonna go down. What will happen to the team? Well, clearly productivity of the entire team will also decline. If you now do that to a second person, not only will the productivity decline because of the loss of productivity of the second individual, you're going to start to see these ripple effects where now other people in the team are going to have to pick up the slack and they're going to feel stressed because their team is not performing very well. And pretty soon you get a dramatic decline in the performance of the entire team. Now, I want to make a, clear, a clarification about the example that I just made. Even though I used colors here just to represent the different people, I didn't say anything about black people, women, people with disabilities. The take home message that I want you to get from this example is that anything that a company does that makes any employee feel excluded because of personal traits impacts the whole company adversely. In other words, if you're not being inclusive, you're shooting yourself in the foot. There is nothing about race, nothing about sexual orientation, gender identity. This is a universal statement. So conversely, as companies, we should do everything that we can to create an environment in which everyone is able to have maximum productivity, which is, of course, means being really satisfied in what they're doing. And if you think about it, this makes sense because what is a company? You know, we talk about a company influencing the people, but the company is nothing but the collection of people. It's not the building. So that means that whatever you as a company do that has a negative influence on your people will come back to bite you in the rear end because that's ultimately what your company's performance depends on. It's the performance of all these people. I hope that this little thought experiment, actually the two thought experiments, helped you to realize why we think it's important to revisit our question. The question is not so much how does diversity impact performance, right? We need to start to realize that inclusion is also crucial to performance. But what I want to do now is I want to show you some of the scientific work that has led me to doing this work that also shows that inclusion is also crucial to create and sustain a diverse organization. And that really you need all of these ingredients to be a successful company.